Hi, this is Dr. Ben Finio with Science Buddies, and this video will show you how you can program your own COVID-19 or other infectious disease simulator using Scratch. This project is inspired by simulators like this one from the Washington Post that show how the disease can spread through a population and how people become infected and recover over time. These simulations are very important for showing how we can flatten the curve, or keep the total number of sick people at any given time below our hospital capacity. For example, watch how rapidly the infection spreads in this simulation with no social distancing in place. Compared to this one where many of the dots hold still, representing social distancing. The rest of this video will walk you through some of the basics of getting the simulation set up and then we'll talk about some more advanced features you can add on your own. First, if you haven't already, go to scratch.mit.edu and create a new account and then start a new project. You can see I have a blank project here where I've created a single sprite that has two costumes representing a healthy and infected state, using a green and red circle respectively. First, let's program the basic motion of this dot so it moves and bounces around the screen. I'm going to do that starting with the when green flag clicked block, and then I'm going to create an infinite loop where the dot will move forward and bounce when it hits the edge of the screen using the if on edge bounce block. This will give you the basic motion where the dot moves around and bounces off the edges. It's good practice to use a variable here instead of hard coding a number like this, so let's add a variable. I'm going to create a variable called speed available for all sprites in case I add more dots later. We'll talk about that in a bit. Then at the beginning of my program, I'm going to set the speed to the number I want and then use speed inside this move block. Now when I run the program, since I've changed the speed to three, the dot's going to move a little slower. I'd also like my simulation to be different each time or have an element of randomness to it, so I'm going to put the dot in a random location at the beginning of each program. I'm going to use the go to random position block, and I'd also like to have a point in a random direction. I can do that using the point in direction block, and then a random number from the operator section Scratch measures angles and degrees, so I can tell it to pick a random number from 1 to 360 degrees. Now, every time I run the program, the dot will move to a new location and point in a random direction. So that gives us the code for a single sprite, but for our simulation, we're going to want more than one. So your first instinct might be to just go ahead and duplicate that sprite a few times, but that isn't going to scale very well. Your program will work if you run it and you have the multiple dots moving around, but what if you want 100 sprites? You don't want to have to manually copy this one 100 times. So we're going to delete those and use the clone feature instead, which can be found in the control menu. You'll see this block called create clone of myself. So for example, if I wanted to create 10 clones of this initial sprite, I could use the create clone block combined with a loop For example, if I say repeat 10 times, create a clone of myself, this will create 10 clones of the initial sprite. However, when I do that, you'll see we have a problem. I still only have one dot moving around. The other clones are all sitting on top of each other here and not moving. I need to use a separate event to tell those clones what to do. Under control, we have when I start as a clone. So if I drag that out and duplicate my motion commands, Now all of my clones will move around just like the original sprite. So I have just committed a major programming sin and this is a mistake that a lot of new programmers will make and something you want to avoid. I have duplicated the exact same code in two different places. So going forward, this can be a problem because if I update the code in one place, I have to remember to update it somewhere else. So in general in programming, we would define a function to do this, which is a block of code that you only write once that you can call upon from other places in your code. In Scratch, you can do that by creating your own block. So I'm going to create two different blocks here. I'm going to call one start location, and I'm going to call the other one move loop. 
and Scratch will now allow me to define these. So I'm going to move some of my code into these functions. I'm going to move the forever loop that makes the blocks move around into the move loop. And I'm going to move these two starting commands that tell the block to go, the sprite to go to a random position and random orientation into my start location block. And now I can get rid of this code for my initial sprite and for my clones and use the custom blocks instead. So I put in start location. This one's going to create the clones, then it's going to enter its move loop. And this one's going to enter its move loop. This will apply to all the clones. Now when I run this, you see I get the same behavior, but I don't have this code duplicated anywhere. If I want to change it, I only have to change it within these custom blocks and then it will apply everywhere else. So that's great, we have a bunch of dots moving around, but we don't really have a simulation of disease transmission. So we're going to start developing that by using the costumes, again, to represent healthy and infected individuals. So we're going to start our initial sprite off as kind of patient zero with the infected red costume, but we are going to have all of the other sprites start with the healthy green costume. So now when we run this, you see we have the one red dot moving around and a bunch of the healthy green dots moving around. And what we would like to happen is whenever this red dot bumps into one of the green dots, the green dot will turn red and become infected. And there are some more advanced ways you can do this using lists and a unique ID for each sprite and a state variable that says whether it's healthy or infected but we're kind of going to do this using a much simpler method with the touching color block. So for each one of the green sprites, we will be able to detect whether it is touching the red color, and then we will change its costume to red, and that will allow the disease to spread through the population by turning them all red. So we're going to do that by adding an if statement into our motion loop here, and we're going to use sensing or if touching a color. And in this case, we want that color to be, we're going to use the color picker tool, we're going to pick the red we've used for the infected sprite. So if that sprite ever touches a red color, then it will switch its costume to the infected color, and that will allow the red color to propagate throughout the population when they bump into each other. So now when we hit run, you can see the moment that red dot touches another dot, that dot turns red and so on until all of our dots are red and our whole population is infected. Now, it's important to emphasize at this point that obviously this is not a completely realistic simulation because once everybody gets infected, they stay infected. Whereas in the real world, eventually some people would recover and then be immune to the virus and no longer pass it on to others. There are many more features you could add here. For example, here I've added a timer so you could count how long it takes until the infection is spread to the whole population. With a little more advanced code, you could also add counters for the number of healthy and infected individuals. You could add recovery and death to the simulation. Right now, everybody just gets sick and stays sick, but you could make individuals get better after a certain period of time and then remain immune after that. I'm not gonna demonstrate all of those. You can kind of try those on your own if you'd like, but one thing I would like to show is the effect of social distancing. So what happens if some of these people stay home and don't move around as much? Does that prevent the infection from spreading as quickly? So what we'll do to demonstrate that is define another new function. We'll call that social distancing. And the social distancing function is going to be very similar to our move loop, except it's not actually going to have movement in it. It's just going to have this code to detect if they bump into someone and then change to the infected costume, but they're not actually going to move around. And we are going to randomly decide whether our individual sprites move around or practice social, social distancing and hold still using a random number generator. So we're going to have an if else statement here, and we're going to add a random number. So we're going to pick a random number between one and two. If that number is equal to one, then this person is going to move around. 
if that number is not equal to one, this should give it a 50-50 chance, then that person is going to practice social distancing. So again, we still have our initial infected patient that's going to move around here, but then all of the other people are going to randomly decide whether to move around or stay home. So when I run the simulation, now you see we have a few dots moving around and a few that are holding still, practicing social distancing. So what you should see is that these irresponsible people moving around do still pass the infection to others eventually, but it should take much longer for everyone to get infected because this social distancing helps flatten the curve and spread out the amount of time it takes for everyone to get infected. We can really see the effects of the social distancing if we crank up the number of clones in the simulation. For example, here I've changed it to have 100 clones and I've changed my random number generator so nobody will practice social distancing and everyone will move around. When I do this, you can see how rapidly the infection spreads to the entire population. For example, here it took less than 10 seconds for everyone to become infected. If I change my random number parameters such that only 1 in 10 people move around and everybody else practices social distancing, then the infection takes much longer to spread. Again, this is important for flattening the curve and making sure the total number of sick individuals at any given time is below our total hospital capacity. Here, it takes over twice as long for the infection to spread to the entire population. So, hopefully this video has provided enough of a starting point for you to get going with your own simulation. If you look in the description below the video, you will find a link to the written instructions, where you can also find a link to the Scratch project online, which you can create a copy of to remix and use as a starting point for your own project. If you visit us at www.sciencebuddies.org, you can find many other science activities related to COVID-19 and plenty of other fun activities you can do at home.